Good evening. This is a very selected audience. It's my pleasure to introduce Hulbushan Singh Kultura Yanshi tonight uh, for friends and fellow fellows, simply Kulu. Kulu was born in 1985 in Malkapur, a small rural town in the central part of the subcontinent, very far away from the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains that became important for him much later. Kulu's father was a police officer and sent him to a military school as a way to make sure that Kulu got a good education. And being at a military school, Kulu developed the plan, nearly obviously, inevitably, to join the army. But the army rejected him because of a slight irregularity in the iris of one of his eyes, something that never bothered him in the least. His eyesight is perfectly sharp. Nevertheless, we should be very grateful to the Indian army for this decision. As an alternative, he decided to become a forest guard. Until he realized that the main function of Indian forest guards was to supervise the production of timber and to allow themselves to be corrupted by people who make money out of timber. This Kulu did not find appealing. Meanwhile, he had become interested in mountaineering. He had read adventure books on the subject, knew by heart, as he told me, all the peaks of the Himalaya and the name of those who succeeded in climbing them for the first time. His main focus at this time were the mountains in themselves, but little by little he got also interested in animals and humans living in the region. When he was 20, he discovered that there was a master's course in wildlife, biology and conservation at the University of Manipal in the state of Karnataka in the south on the coast. He applied there and was admitted. And that was the end of the military career. After his master, he proceeded to write his PhD on the human carnivore conflicts in the Spiti Valley in the western Himalaya close to the border between India and Tibet. Since then, Kulu has been working mainly for two NGOs, the Snow Leopard Trust, based in Seattle, and the Nature Conservation Foundation, based in Mysore, very far away from each other. Kulu is directly responsible not only for his research, of course, but also for the raising of funds, which presupposes the ability to seduce people far outside the discipline. It presupposes also logistic skills in organizing research and expeditions. Kulu's lab is a desertic region at an altitude between 3,800 and 4,000 meters, where it can get very cold indeed. In a certain sense, he has remained a bit of an adventurer. His main focus is the preservation of wildlife, but he knows very well that you cannot preserve wildlife unless you achieve a balance between it and the human population. He has to communicate not only with snow leopards, but also with people. And at this, as you have come to realize in the past few months, he is exceptionally good. With this, Kulu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Luca Giuliani, for the wonderful introduction. Um, thank you, Professor Barbara Stolberg Rillinger, for the opportunity to give today evening's colloquium and, and everybody at VICO uh, for, the, for the wonderful uh, time that we're having here. Uh, but most importantly, thanks to all of you for coming for this uh, supposed public lecture, although all the public is behind the cameras. Um, and I gave a colloquium only a little over a month ago. Uh, so today's colloquium is actually for you guys, uh, for the people in this room, uh, first and foremost. Uh, I've tried to make sure that there is limited overlap between what I spoke earlier and, and what I'm going to speak today, uh, but I have brought in elements which are necessary. 
So today I want to start uh, with a story. It was almost 10 years ago. Um, in the autumn of 2011, uh, I was living my dream. I was studying snow leopards in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. Uh, I was engaged to Bhagishri, Pagya, and I was going to finish that fieldwork and come back and marry her. Um, I was studying how snow leopard populations and their diet uh, change with availability of wild prey and livestock. But I was also helping a good friend and colleague, uh, Orian Johansson, who had a long-term snow leopard radio telemetry project in the region, and he was doing his PhD on how snow leopards move in this landscape and how do they find prey. And in an unfortunate motorbike accident, Orian fell and dislocated his shoulder, and he had to fly back to Sweden to get treated. And I had this very difficult choice of whether I stay alone and continue my work, or I go back and come back another day uh, to do this. But you know, Professor uh, Luca Giuliani mentioned my introduction. I wasn't going to give up on a good adventure. So I decided to continue, of course. And it was only after Orian left did I realize the vastness of the desert. Uh, I was alone. I was studying a very solitary species of cat in the region that I almost never saw when I was there, except when we were catching them for radio telemetry. Uh, and, and that really gave me a sense of, of solitude. You know, the, the desert would just peter off in the horizon and then blend into the sky. And, and it, would, it, it was just a, a, a different feeling. My day would look something like this. I had, I had gridded the, the mountain range in the region, and every morning I would go to a pre-decided spot. I would look at a mountain range like this and try and imagine how snow leopard uses the, these mountains, and then go on to those ridge lines looking for their signs. And if I could find any hair or poop samples, then I would collect them to later extract DNA out of it to do population estimation and to do diet studies. I had also designed a way where I could do transect in these mountains and then estimate uh, populations of wild herbivores that were living here. And, and this, was, this was the ultimate life that, that I had ever dreamed, to be alone in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia and to be studying snow leopards in, in such an exciting way. Uh, my, my camp was uh, what is in Mongolian called a gare. Uh, it was a, a, a small little hut like this, uh, actually this very one. And I had a satellite phone. Um, it was very expensive to make calls on that satellite phone. I never made a single call, but Bhagya and I would, I could send these tiny messages less than 100 KB every evening. I would send two messages every evening, one to my office saying, I'm all right, I'm back in the camp after a day's work. And second, I would, I would often send a message to Bhagya. And I remember one day, sending this message saying, I saw Amur falcons, and these falcons must have begun their migration from the Amur region, and now they will fly south to India, and then they will cut across India, and then go all the way to South Africa. I mean, it's, it's marvelous that these falcons, these little birds fly from Amur, uh, you know, in, in Far East Russia to South Africa every winter and back. And the next day I got an email from her. Interestingly, she was then then a part of a field research team uh, close to the border between India and Burma in the rainforest there. And she said, yeah, today morning we saw a flock of Amur falcons. They are indeed, indeed migrating. And, and I remember wondering about, you know, both of us being in these really isolated places and, and still this, this connection between us through a, a migratory bird. Uh, you know, for a, for a young, newly engaged couple, that was the most romantic thing that I could have ever imagined. But then seasons change, autumn turned to winter, and every day it would get more dangerous for me to go out in the field alone, because if I twisted an ankle or broke my leg and couldn't make it to camp by night, it would be very difficult for people who were looking for me to, to rescue me in time. It was very, very cold by then. Um, but the truth is, I was never truly alone. Uh, this area is a few thousand square kilometers, and there are also migratory nomadic herders uh, who live here. 
the 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 nomadic herders here graze this uh, breed of goats to to produce pashmina or uh, cashmere uh, and and my apologies i'll keep switching between the word pashmina and cashmere because pashmina is the indian word for cashmere and it just it just slips my attention um and and i'd made friends with many of them every time i would pass by you know somebody's gear i would stop and have tea with them it's almost rude uh, it's not almost rude it is rude to pass by somebody's gear and not to visit them and so any time they were passing by my camp they would also stop and and say hello and have a cup of tea i didn't speak much mongolian but that was never a problem uh, you know in the desert when you meet somebody you know you just happy to see someone and and they also live very far from each other about 10 to 15 kilometers between every family um but then it was i didn't think much about it uh, it was time for me to come back to ulanbator that's a picture of ulanbator uh, where i was going to do all the dna extraction and and in all the science that i was there to do but every day i was thinking what gift am i going to buy for bagishri when i come back uh, you know because i was going to come back and and get married uh of course diamonds i wasn't going to buy as if i could afford them uh but i used up all my savings to buy a pair of cashmere gloves and i thought that was the most beautiful fabric i'd ever touched it was the smoothest thing i could have imagined uh and little did i know that this fabric was going to consume the next uh 10 years of my life i came back and forgot about all of this and then about a year later Conservation Biology published this paper. It was titled "Globalization of the Cashmere Market and the Decline of Large Mammals in Asia." Uh, so, in the map, the map is of of uh, Central and South Asia. You know, the the country in the north is Russia, uh, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, China, and then Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. The area that is shaded is the snow leopard distribution. but like i mentioned in my previous talk the snow leopard distribution almost exactly matches uh, the high mountains of of this region and this paper argued that 90% of world's cashmere is grown in this region this paper went on to argue that since the turn of the century cashmere prices have gone up three folds and so people living in these areas have started keeping more and more goats in fact to the point of replacing many of their other livestock with the single uh, species of goat and then uh, they also argued that goats compete with other wild herbivores of this region for food for forage and they collected data from secondary literature for, um, for populations of livestock uh, cashmere goats and wild herbivores and what they found in in all these places wild herbivore biomass was less than 5% of total biomass of herbivores so imagine by uh, per kilo to per kilo there were 95 uh, uh cashmere goats or livestock and five wild herbivores and and so the conclusion of the paper was quite dire that cashmere is having very severe impact on local uh, wildlife population of this region uh they also pay attention to the snow leopard where what they further argue is that a decline in wild herbivore population herbivores like the snow leopard the ibex the argali i spoke about them in in my previous talk as their populations go down so do carnivore populations and every time snow leopard killed an expensive cashmere goat people were forced to retaliate because it was expensive uh and and so the snow leopard was suffering almost a double whammy uh in this case and the the this paper is also like a review because it pulls in evidence from all uh, many different independent studies so the conclusions were were very clear um so if if this paper was right and if all the studies that back this was right then the question comes to mind so what is the conservation status of wildlife or large mammals in central asia and like i mentioned in my previous talk conservation status is usually resolved using the iucn definition the international union for conservation on, of nature which is based in switzerland um and they have an interesting scale a species goes from 
uh, from being least concern, just the label itself is concerning to call something least concern in, in the Anthropocene, but it goes from very common species being least concerned to being near threatened, to being endangered, to being critically endangered, to being extinct in the wild and to being extinct. And so what I did was to, to look at some of the, the more common herbivores and the one carnivore, snow leopard in this region. And what I, so under each picture you have the name of the species and in brackets you have the IUCN uh, categorization, but that is not important. What I did was I looked at the previous two assessments and between the two assessments, if a species moves toward towards extinction, then it has a red box. And if a species is moving away from extinction, it has a green box. And if a species has remained stable, it has a yellow box. And although the original paper looked at the eight endemic species of this region, I have expanded it to include a few more species and, and you know what you see is 15 sp different species. There are some very interesting examples. The wild horse or Przewalski's horse or Taki as they are called in Mongolian, they had gone extinct. They are the only species of wild horse in the world. They had gone extinct uh, except in a few European zoo. You can, you can see them in Berlin Zoo. Uh, and then they were reintroduced uh, in Mongolia and in China. And since then the population has grown and now they are, they are endangered. Uh, the critically endangered Bactrian camel. But what is very clear is there are at least five species that, are, that have improved on their IUCN uh, categorization. Most have remained stable and only one species, the, the ibex, the Himalayan ibex has actually worsened and it's worsened from being least concerned to near threatened. And I was part of the assessment team and, and actually it was, the evidence is not very clear, but we still moved it because we wanted to take a, a cautious approach. So what explains this contradiction? On the one side, you have ecological studies saying that wild herbivores comprise less than 5% of, of herbivore biomass in this region. But if you're looking at them on an on a IUCN scale, this tells a very different story. Uh, and, and this is where we have to examine two things. One is how do we, how do we assess ecological evidence? And the second is how do we assess the conservation status itself. And so let me start with the conservation status story. Uh, bits of it I mentioned, I'd mentioned in my previous talk, but today I'm going to go into some of the details that I couldn't in, in the previous talk. So the snow leopard case study is what I'm most familiar with. So we'll go over this once again. As I'd mentioned, IUCN downlisted snow leopards from being endangered to vulnerable in 2017. It, the, the assessment was led by a three-member team and this uh, really split the, the snow leopard research and conservation community in two groups, uh, the eastern group and the western group uh, as I like to call them. Uh, the eastern group had the range country governments and scientists and conservationists who are based in the 12 countries where snow leopards occur. And the western group was largely led by IUCN and a lot of other big conservation organizations as well as universities uh, based largely in the West. Uh, a lot of heated arguments happened, a lot was written and we're going to look at two opinion pieces. The first opinion piece I want to show you is written by David Mallon and Rodney Jackson. Both of them were part of the assessment team and, and their, the, the title of the paper was A Downless is Not a Demotion. Red list status and reality. Uh, I, I'm very surprised that they got away with the word reality in the title. I mean, here at Vico, we, we can't seem to agree upon it. Um, and I have a few quotes from that paper. I, I think one of the, the most important thing they said is, unbiased estimates of population density and abundance that incorporate uncertainty are essential components of any assessment of a species status, including those for the red list. And the concluding remarks that they make in the paper say, downloading on the IUCN red list indicates that the species concern is further from extinction and is always to be welcomed, whether resulting from successful conservation interventions or improved knowledge of status and trends. Celebrating success is important 
to reinforce the message that conservation works and to incentivize donors. Now, this is interesting because actually the Western group was blaming the Eastern group for wanting to keep the snow leopard so that the funding can keep coming. And whereas in, in here, the argument is actually pro-funding. Uh, this was challenged by, by these two authors, Som Ale from Nepal and Charudat Mishra from India. And because Oryx rejected their, their response, they published it in science. And some of the quotes from their paper, they say, IUCN assessment uses estimates of mature individuals. If there are fewer than 2,500 mature individuals, then the species is considered endangered. And if there are more than that, then it's vulnerable. The other thing they mention is, records show just three of 344 captive snow leopards bred at age two, uh, two years old, yet IUCN assessment used age two to three as the age of maturity. And finally, they, they try to make a comeback saying, desk-based announcements and celebration of reduced extinction risk should be rejected in favor of rigorous field-based scientific evidence. Now, the two things I want to really stress here is, this big disagreement actually boiled down to one thing. How many mature individuals of snow leopards are there in the world? And that one thing is affected by two parameters. How many snow leopards are there in the world? And at what age do they breed? Two years or three years? This, this whole thing was, was about, about just that. And like I mentioned in my previous work, uh, previous talk, after a lot of debate and discussion, the community came together and they agreed on one thing. They said, we need scientific, scientifically robust estimates of snow leopard population. That's what we need. And, and that led to launch of uh, this, this really big project called PAUSE, a population assessment of world's snow leopards. Um, and, and I quote from the, the meeting that happened in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. At the International Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Conservation Forum 2017 in Bishkek, the range country governments formally endorse a plan to develop a global snow leopard population assessment. The ambitious initiative called Population Assessment of World Snow Leopards, or in short, PAUSE, aims to produce a robust estimate of the threatened cat's population status within the next five years. This was in 2017. Uh, I've been very involved with this work and I, I went into details of this work last time, so I'm going to quickly brush through it. One of the first papers we published was sampling bias in snow leopard population estimation studies, trying to show that existing work was biased towards small sites and sites which were exceptionally good for snow leopard studies, and hence the conclusions could not be extrapolated to this vast uh, mountainous area. We also published papers on how one can use this method called occupancy survey to study distributions of animals, uh, of snow leopards, so that one can stratify the habitat based on this, and then use that stratification for further research. In the past, we'd also published papers on how one can do prey assessments, and, and we'd shown that prey is actually a very critical determinant of, of snow leopard populations. Um, we also worked very closely with the Indian government, because after countries signed on to that agreement that they're going to do these countrywide assessment, we worked very closely with the Indian Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Um, after, after a long conversation, they said, but we don't like the acronym PAUSE. And so they came up with Snow Leopard Population Assessment of India, SPY. And here is our minister, uh, Mr. Prakash Zavdekar, uh, releasing this report. Uh, the, the report really carries a lot of the research that, that our teams have led. Um, and then very recently, uh, and I, I mentioned this work in my previous talk, uh, we we really tried to do things at a very different scale. We estimated snow leopard populations at a scale uh, which was larger than all the previous studies put together. And 
So, we, we estimated uh, snow leopard populations for the Indian state of Himachal Pradesh, which is the size of Belgium. Actually, the state is twice the size of Belgium, just the snow leopard habitat is uh, the size of Belgium. Uh, but it was only when this exercise got completed, that's the report that we submitted to the government. And, and actually, the title of that, that report is, is what made me reflect on this uh, status of snow leopard and prey in Himachal Pradesh. So on completing this exercise, uh, it is when I was like, okay, we are answering the, the question status, what is the status of snow leopard and prey in Himachal Pradesh? And we are saying it is 52 because there are 52 snow leopards in Himachal Pradesh. And, and you know, like I mentioned in my previous talk, that's where I felt like a character from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, where the, the second best computer, Deep Thought, answered the great question to life, universe, and everything with 42. And, and you know, to come to think of it, what is the conservation status of snow leopards in the world? And as this project proceeds, we are going to answer it something like 4,692 or 8,542. That, that's the answer that we're going to come up with. Um, but more importantly, even if I ask the question, why are snow leopards vulnerable or why are snow leopards endangered? And the answer that comes is because there are more than 2,500 mature individuals. Why 2,500 is a very, very abstract, uh, a number that came out of a hat. Th there are some bases to it, it's not completely that, but, um, or worse still, Snow leopards are endangered because they breed at age two and not at age three. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the way we've designed these assessments are, are heavily biocentric. They place, they, they almost make it sound like the conservation status of a species is a biological trait of the species itself, you know, because it, it's, it all depends on how many there are, when they are breeding, how much do they breed, how much do they live. And the fact that the snow leopard research and conservation community came together to estimate snow leopard population is further telling because we did not come together and say, let's go out and count how much area we are losing to mining. How much area are we losing to, to dams or any other big infrastructure project? We did not come together to say, okay, let's come together and estimate the area that uh, the, the snow leopard habitat that we are going to lose to climate change. We did not count Kashmir goats. Kashmir goats clearly seem to be affecting 15 species, but we're not counting them. And, and that, that is my point, which is this biocentric approach of looking at conservation excludes the, the or, or precludes the possibility that, that these these factors have an effect on, on what, uh, what the status of, uh, or, or what the conservation of a species uh, would be. And so the absence of these anthropogenic measurements from species assessment also illuminate that the current model of assessment still thinks of conservation in isolation of other human endeavors. It thinks the, the, the nature culture duality uh, is, is very much there. Uh, it assumes a distinction where, in places where wildlife conservation occurs and where human development occurs. And this is an unbeknownst hanging on to the old idea of wilderness and the old idea of fortress conservation. That brings me back to my earlier question about, uh, you know, uh, the, the paper seemed to have presented some clear evidence about how Kashmir goats seem to affect uh, wild herbivores in this region. And, and so, so let's, let's look at that a little more closely. The word Kashmir comes from the word Kashmir. Kashmir has unfortunately been in the news for all the wrong reasons for the last three decades. Um, Kashmir is a beautiful place in the western Himalaya and this place doesn't produce the Kashmir wool itself. This place has, for the last 700 years, some of the West, world's best artisans when it comes to spinning, weaving, and designing uh, clothes. 
Uh, cashmere wool, the wool is a fiber that has to be less than 19 microns in thickness and it is essentially goat fleece, fleece that comes from goats. And typically these goats were raised up on the Tibetan plateau in Ladakh and, and Tibet and parts of Central Asia and the Kashmiris would trade uh, with these regions and, and get the wool and then the combination of some of the best fiber in the world and some of the best artisans really produced uh, you know, one of the best garments that, that humans have ever seen. And actually the other day at lunch, uh, Francisco and Sophie, they're not here, but they, they were mentioning, they were talking about this French physician, Francois Bonner, and I didn't know anything about him until I was preparing for this talk. And I realized that Francois Bonner was actually amongst the first Europeans to visit Kashmir and to describe how these weavers were working together as families uh, uh, building these shawls. And, and he provides one of the first written accounts of all of this in the 1600s. But of course, not all attention to Kashmir was benign. Uh, the great Mughal ruler Akbar was the first amongst many to try and invade the, this region to control the, the trade in fabric. The tra it was already being traded with Iran and Persia and very soon with Europe. Uh, so here I have a painting uh, from Padsha Nama. Padsha Nama is the a collective uh, writing about Shah Jahan's early life. Shah Jahan, one of the great Mughals, the, the maker of Taj Mahal itself. He's seated up there. Uh, I think this is the pointer. Yeah, that's that Shah Jahan. He's seated up there. And the historian Janet Rizvi argues that there are at least two people in this court who are wearing Kashmiri shawls and very likely Kashmir. One is this person up here and the other one is this person here. And this is the father-in-law of Shah Jahan. And, and I think that one of the world's uh, best uh, garment, uh, you know, is, is befitting, uh, or it's befitting that the garment is present in Shah Jahan's court whose reign brought, was, the, was the pinnacle of art and architecture in, in India. Um, <clears throat> that's Empress Josephine. And the, the scholar Levi, uh, Monique Levi-Strauss argues that uh, the period between 1800 and 1880, French fashion was really obsessed with Kashmir and, and a lot of Kashmir was, was traded. And actually I was, I was trying to find out more about this and I came across an, an article in the Scientific American published in 1862. And I'm going to read a few quotes from it. It's very interesting. Uh, the piece on, on Kashmir doesn't have an author that I could find. So my apologies for that. It starts by saying, a statement has been very widely disseminated that M. Voisin of France has lately invented an improved loom in which shawls are woven in such a manner as to rival the famous products of Kashmir. In this case, the word Kashmir is both the region Kashmir and, and the fabric. Later in the article, they say, though the cost and fame of the Kashmir shawl are doubtless principally due to the mode of weaving it, they result also to some extent from the rare material from which it is made. This is the product of the Kashmir goat and is much finer and softer than the finest Saxony wool. And further down uh, in the article they say, the Orientals rival the most civilized nations in the production and combination of colors in the shawls. And I find it amazing how, how these gentlemen, their, their idea of civilization was challenged by, by shawls from Kashmir. So now on the one hand you have a regal, a regal fiber, a regal fabric, and on the other hand you have a, a really royal cat, the, the snow leopard. And, and, and I was very interested in the relationship between Kashmir the fiber, Kashmir the goats, the goats that produce this fiber, the herders who raise this, these goats, and, and the snow leopards who who affect, who directly prey on these goats and affect the livelihoods of these herders. And so if you were to look at herders uh, of Kashmir a little more closely, 
This is a picture that my colleague Rizindorji took. This is from India in the Changtang region. Uh, a lot of attempts to raise, to produce Kashmir in Europe and America failed. A lot of these goats were brought here. Uh, one of the forms of taxes during the British Empire was 12 Kashmir goats that Kashmir would give and they would bring it to different parts of the empire trying to grow them in other places and it failed every time. Because this fiber is actually, it, it, it is produced at the interaction of the goat and its environment, uh, the dry, intense cold of Central Asia. And so what the herders are doing is every winter they, they take these goats in these extremely cold areas and, and let the goats be there so that they can develop this, this, this really fine wool. But that's a very hard life for the herder because the herder is himself or herself exposing themselves to that cold, living out there, often spending the nights in the open protecting their, their goats from snow leopards and wolves and other species. And the returns are very less, uh, the returns aren't very good. That's their, that's their relationship between the goat and the herder and the, the elements. But like I mentioned in my previous talk, again, I want to briefly touch upon the case study again. This is the place that I started today's talk with, the Toast Mountains of, of Mongolia in the Gobi Desert. And the entire area was given away to exploratory mining in 2010. And it was the 70 odd herders who live sparse in this area, who are nomadic grazers, came together. And under the Mongolian law, they declared their own commons as local protected area. And here I want to acknowledge the contribution of two people. Sumbe, who was a very good friend and colleague, and unfortunately he's not with us anymore. But Sumbe and I worked together to do herbivore assessments of these areas. We walked many of these transects again later in 2012 and 13 to do a, a pre, uh, pre estimate. And my colleague Bayarjargal Avanseren or Baira. Baira led uh, the movement to get the local protected area declared into a national level nature reserve. And today this place is a nature reserve with full rights to the, the herders to, to use this place. And in, in the sense, uh, like I mentioned last time, the fate of the herder and the snow leopard is, is entangled here, uh, where even though their day-to-day -day interaction may be antagonistic, the, the overall fate is, is an entangled one. Like I mentioned, living with snow leopards is not easy. And as, as somebody who tries to practice conservation, we, we, we did this project in Mongolia. We wanted to pro help the herders protect their goats from snow leopards and, and other carnivores. So an international team of conservationists flew into, into the Gobi Desert and and we build these fences around the places where they, they stockade their livestock for the night. The main problem here is when a carnivore gets in, they don't just kill one or two, they'll kill 30, 40, sometimes even more. And this was designed in the most uh, beautifully done scientific experiment of before after control impact design where herders were chosen randomly who got the, the fences and then herders who did not and it wasn't surprising at the end of one year that, of course, no snow leopard or wolf could get into these fences and, and do any harm. But what was surprising was that people's attitudes towards conservation or snow leopards did not change. And I did not think much about it back then because I thought one needs to give time. You know, these things happen slowly. We, we need to give it more time. But then during the pandemic, I was involved in another, another such effort in India this time. Uh, we started getting calls from this one village called Samdo, and in a week, this village lost over 100 uh, Kashmir goats, they're very expensive goats. And so we went there and we offered to help. Now, interestingly, this days, there was no time to do a, a design and experiment, and so we just talked to the herders and, and you know, seek their inputs and their ideas as to how this can be solved, and we only provided financial inputs. The herders designed a, a very different form of corals, which were actually roofed corals uh, with, with mesh. And we, we got these designed, confirmed with engineers for their structural stability. They were much cheaper than what we were doing in India. 
and then a year later they were working just as beautifully as any uh, cutting edge designed uh, you know from anywhere in the world interestingly because the ownership was from the herders themselves next year all the other villages wanted to do this in their own village and so even though we did not do an attitude so, uh, study uh, uh, pre post i feel very comfortable in seeing this that i think the attitudes in this community towards conservation and people did indeed change so let's look at look at kashmir production in india and and this is the this is the the one uh, little case study i want to uh, quickly present this is the changtang region of ladakh the border is is with on on the other side is tibet china and this is the place that has been in the news over the last year where some of the biggest uh, military standoff in the world are happening right now you know two nuclear power countries are staring into each other's eyes right here and this is right in the middle of prime pashmina country uh the the region is about 30000 square feet, uh, square kilometers about 1500 families raise 200 to 500 goats uh, to produce kashmir and this area also has some really beautiful wildlife uh, this is a picture of kiang these are tibetan gazelle the only population of tibetan gazelle in india and last time i mentioned there are snow leopards lynx wolves argali ibex blue sheep uh, we we spoke about them uh, last time all of them occur in this region and so for us uh, the goal was how do we affect production of pashmina or kashmir and its international uh, export in a way that wildlife doesn't suffer negative consequences and some of these ideas were developed together with my colleagues friends mentors uh, charudat mishra and suri venkatchalam and of course my partner in crime ajay bijur ajay and i work very closely in, on all these projects and in the picture is my colleague uh, rigzindor you've seen many of his pictures i mean he's more comfortable on those rocks and snow than i am on my couch uh, and you know all all he ever wants is a is a pair of binoculars and a camera and these big mountains and and he's off uh, looking at wildlife so this this area has value for both kashmir production and for wildlife conservation and the the tricky wicked problem is how can we have our cake and eat it too and we tried a few things but then eventually we brought everybody all the stakeholders in pashmina uh, in in the pashmina industry under the same roof we brought herders their families the young children who were studying outside the local elected representatives the animal husbandry department the forest department the veterinary care department the wool and something department the entrepreneurs uh local professors everybody to discuss their problems and and to try and come up with a joint vision for how do we want kashmir production in ladakh to be and my colleague ajay likes to call it the 1% solution because india produces only 1% of global kashmir but he completely believes that if we can find a model where conservation uh, where wildlife conservation and pashmina production can succeed then this 1% solution can be scaled to the 100% and what one of the interesting observations for me during this 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 meeting was that people depending on who they were had very different perception of the problem itself the herders said that actually it's herding itself which is threatened because next generation doesn't want to become herders and so who's going to herd after we die the the animal husbandry department said actually goat numbers are declining and it is our mandate to increase it and we are failing at our mandate uh you know because uh and that's completely contradictory to what ecologists feel ecologists feel that goat numbers are increasing and it's damaging the pastures and it's it's detrimental for wildlife however with all these differences these groups came together and finally they articulated a vision and the vision was for ladakh pashmina because they want an identity and ownership of the fabric and so as opposed to calling it kashmir they want to call it ladakh pashmina 
And the, the, the vision is Ladakh Pashmina becomes an exclusive global brand of ecologically and culturally sustainable fiber, bringing significant economic benefits to the herders and becoming the pride of Ladakh. Uh, they, they also had very clearly articulated mission statements to transform pashmina production in Changthang through sustainable grazing practices, set practices to produce high quality pashmina and other finished goods within Ladakh, create a globally recognizable brand for sustainable pashmina, to create supply chains that uh, supply chains where profits are equitably shared between various stakeholders from the herders to the finished product makers. And, and while these seem abstract, they've made good progress. Uh, here is my colleague Shemei Lamo. She is developing this, uh, this website, which is based on the idea of building a brand for sustainable Pashmina with the idea of transparency and value proposition. Can we make everything transparent about our goats, our herding methods, our people, their culture? And so, so everything uh, by, just, by just letting the world know how Pashmina is produced in Ladakh. How do we make it uh, sustainable? Last time I spoke about the Shandong to Stupa conversion. Shandongs are these traps where wolves were caught as a management practice by herders and then uh, how the local monks and the local villages are coming together to convert them into stupas, which are a symbol of religion, peace, and harmony, and, and also art. Um, we've started a fellowship for the young people in the region, and currently there are 12 um, Kashmir or Pashmina fellows, as we like to call them. They are getting trained to become uh, environmental entrepreneurs, to be able to be part of this, this supply chain and, and make uh, sustainability meaningful. We're working with the animal husbandry department to improve livestock nutrition and pasture health, both for these goats and for uh, wild herbivores. I spoke about securing these nighttime corals. You know, that is typically how we find them in, and then we work with, with people to secure them in a way that uh, using traditional designs to make sure that snow leopards don't get in. And of course, building trust among the different stakeholders. I mentioned that everybody looks at it from their perspective, and these are different perspectives. And, and we want to appreciate these different perspectives. At the same time, we need to have trust with each other and, and work together. And, and this work is, is actually led by my colleagues, Rigzendorje, Sharab Lubzang, Karma Sonam, Munib Khanyari, uh, Vindya Jyoti. Munib actually comes from a family who's, who've probably been dealing in, in Kashmir for the, for the last 500 years or more, if not. Uh, and with that, I want to conclude. And, and I, in, in summary, I have a couple of things to say. I think one is, while there is greater acknowledgement that conservation is indeed multidisciplinary, the yardsticks through which we measure success and failure of conservation are still very traditional and embedded in current power structures. Uh, implicitly, they're also based on a, on a nature culture duality and embedded in ideas of, of wilderness and protected area. Uh, even when it's well established that wildlife in Central Asia is actually spread across the landscape, these, these dogmas still hound us in the way we, we do things. The relationship between livestock herders and wildlife is complex. Uh, we need to examine it from multiple perspectives. I, I started with an ecological perspective and I, and I ended up with, with a more uh, human nature perspective. And, and it's complex. And what are meaningful conservation action changes uh, depending on, on uh, how we're looking at it. Uh, in a recent book, which is titled The Conservation Revolution, Radical Ideas for Saving Nature Beyond the Anthropocene. Authors Bram Buescher and Rob Fletcher, they propose a model of convivial conservation for a post-capitalistic society and a society that doesn't need nature culture duality. I like to think that this conviviality already exists. Uh, the conviviality between people and wildlife already exists between, uh, in places around the world but in people such as the Changpa herders of Ladakh. And perhaps as conservationists, we only need to, uh, to nurture and sustain this existing uh, conviviality. 
Uh, with that, I think I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much, Kulu, for this second trip to the Himalaya. Questions? Thanks so much, Kulu. It was just fantastic, as always. So thank you. Um, and I have two questions, if possible. Um, one is whether you could say a little bit more about the, uh, you know, the kind of uh, engagement of Ladakh murders in this exercise of you know, the of convivial conservation. So what exactly happened in terms of conflict resolution that your group was involved in that allowed for getting these people to work together towards this work? Because you did, you know, uh, you know, hint at all these different types of conflict, right? And some of which involved me in the perception of the zone effort. I haven't quite understood to me a long time from what you were saying, how in fact the conflict with the zone effort itself was resolved. And how does that come back into the story? And could you just say a bit more about um, conflict and, yeah. and how actually you know, some of yeah. these, I mean, what, what do you think have been ingredients in those kinds of communities for um, a more peaceful kind of cooperation around how does one confront these issues? Right. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the question of, of conflict with snow leopards. It's not a conflict that we have resolved. It's a, it's a conflict that we are trying to manage through sustainable grazing practices, which is to work with herders on different fronts, from protecting their corrals to finding them compensation schemes. <coughs> so to, to work with them on multiple fronts to reduce it and to reduce its impact on people to the extent possible. The other thing is when you have many stakeholders in a, in a situation like this, uh, very often, like when we became interested in this problem, one of the things was all stakeholders were trying to maximize their own operational efficiency, which makes sense. Uh, there was no central coordinating agency, and I cannot claim that we are trying to be the central coordinating agency. However, interestingly, it's also how our budgets work. There are very little budgets. In India, you cannot put a budget for trust building. You know, you cannot put budgets, uh, you can have a lot of departmental meetings, but you cannot have money for interdepartmental meeting. And, and actually the, the conservation money that we brought in allowed to fill some of these gaps where people could actually come together, meet and talk face to face where the entrepreneur was telling the cooperative saying that I don't get good quality material. And the cooperative then said, but you know, the material I get came too late and, and then once they started talking, things, you know. The second thing was the entire system was looking at an export market, which is how can we maximize our cashmere production and export it so that we get more money. And, and my colleague Ajay Bijur's idea of this being one person solution is how can we realize more value locally? So how can we bring back many of those processes locally so that more money doesn't mean more production, but more money means better quality. And again, I don't think these ideas are foolproof, uh, but I think these ideas, one of the most important thing is, while conservationists always acknowledge that we need to work together with, with others, I think this is where the industry acknowledges that it needs to be sustainable, both ecologically and culturally. And I think if, if the one big thing that we could hope to achieve from this project, it's an ongoing project, is to get acknowledgement both in its, in its peak and its action from the Kashmir industry to make it sustainable. I think, I think that's the, that's the main, uh, main crux of this. Um, the story is ongoing, and so while I can fully see how the sheep are so much better protected from the snow leopard now, I'm wondering about the long-term consequences for the snow leopard. So, um, if I understood you correctly, in your last talk, these herds are merely a, a resort of emergency for the snow leopard. So whenever uh, there 
where you, you will foot the uh, base against cars, then they would attack uh, a herd and take sheep away from, from the herd. And this they can't do anymore because the, the herds are so neatly protected. So what's your prediction for the long-term effects on snow leopard uh, population once these, these measures are really uh, you know, uh, found all of the well, thanks, thanks for that. Actually, scholars have argued that livestock herders subsidize snow leopard conservation because their herds are being killed by snow leopards. Uh, ecologically speaking, there are, there's enough evidence to believe that while snow leopards do kill livestock opportunistically, it does not affect their population numbers, which is, and, and this is something Sean and I were talking about. Who is, which is that snow leopard that comes and kills? It's probably a snow leopard which is already on its, on its deathbed because either it's injured or it doesn't have its canines or it's, it's already not contributing to population. And, and that's where IUCN's idea of mature individuals, uh, they're discounting these, these individuals, so to say, although the definition is so ambiguous that it creates a lot of problems. So the, the question really is who are the snow leopards that are doing this? Uh, the, the second thing is, now, now the other argument that w you could say is that in, this, in that case, why should we even care? We need to care because when that damage is too much, the retaliation is disproportionate. Uh, and, and we know, for example, that in the past there were things like wolf dens were, you know, gassed and things. Uh, so the, the retaliation really tends to be very disproportionate. So we still need to address this problem. One is that the other is, um, there's also hope that the 5% versus 95% biomass ratio, that that ratio will improve with, with all the other measures that are being put in place. At the same time, I'm a pragmatic. I think it's not a problem that we are wishing will go away. Snow leopards will still keep killing some goats and there will still be these tense moments, but I think there will be fewer and, and, and less volatile in the reaction of people. I think, I think that's, that's where the, the real tension is. Uh, are we going to see these violent outbursts from people or are we going to see somebody picking up a phone and saying, hey Ajay or hey Khulu, this is this problem, can you guys come over and take a look? Uh, this, the second bit is absolutely fine. We're going to have to live with this, uh, with that. Uh, the first bit is what we're trying to, to get rid of. So, I want to raise an, an issue which you mentioned that biology is not good for conservation and I, I, I have taken issue with that because of course I'm a biologist, but also you cannot make, you know, snow leopards reproduce and it is matter, it is important whether they reproduce at two or three years of age, you know, so the IUCN is, is absolutely justified in having those, those pieces of information. And, and in many cases, maybe not the snow lovers, but people are just bad for conserving, you know, uh, uh, species. I, I, you know, I, I'm a citizen of New Zealand, and you know, wherever people are, it's just bad for wildlife. And so, you know, the best strategy is to get rid of people. And uh, and and you know, and in New Zealand, you can do it because there are offshore islands where you can get rid of people and just yeah. not let them land and enjoy the beaches. And so. You know, there are many cases where the biology rules and the, the human aspect is, is purely negative. And so, so, you know, to say that, that biology is not useful for conservation purposes is, you know, is, is somewhat misleading in, in the sense that, uh, that we are not the ones, unless you're going to, you know, use zoo populations to, to to furnish the, the, the population. And you yourself just said that, that the death of uh, the snow leopard is a natural process. It's not you know, driven by, uh, uh, by humans themselves. And so you know, I guess my question is, if the, 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 the cashmere industry is not affecting 14 of the 15 species that you're looking at, you know, should we cry for the snow leopard? So, I'm not saying that biology is not important. What I'm saying is that biology is not the only thing that should decide whether a species is endangered or not. You know, in, in your example of, of, of New Zealand and, and things, I think we would all be better off if we, 
if, if IUCN assessments were also looking at the number of people who visit these islands. My question is, what is it that we are counting and why? Uh, can, can, can some of those parameters be part of the models that, that then go on to do these assessments? I think it is also because that I, I feel in conservation science or biology, uh, a lot of these models subconsciously drive the questions we ask. So, despite being a conservation biologist, I you know I never study mining or mining effect on snow leopards. I never study how you know how dams are affecting snow leopards. Uh, what I am always studying is is snow leopards themselves and and I think uh, if, if our ways of assessing conservation were to change, were to include these, these dimensions, then I think we, it, I'm thinking of a more holistic system and, and not a system which is, uh, which is only looking at, at ecology. And I, I complete, there are definitely species where the only thing that matters whether they will survive or not is how much they reproduce. I think that's, that's true. But here is a, is a is a tension between trying to come up with one size fits all from tiny microbes to giant whales uh, and I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense to drive global policy and unfortunately we are heading that way because recently there is this there is this paper which is getting a lot of traction in saying that conservation needs a singular message like how the climate debate has the climate debate is 1.5 degrees and no more. You know, let's just focus on that 1.5 degrees. I think those singular messages are problematic because they take attention away from nuance. Sean and I, we were discussing how this whole idea, let's plant a billion trees and that's going to save all our problems. That's going to actually cause more problems than, than is going to save uh, these, these, these very singular ideas I feel. And I think in some ways, I you see an assessment is that singular idea of what it means to be an endangered species. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I am uh, sort of extrapolating this a bit to, um, to our society. Uh, so, is there a point where your sort of uh, pinpoint efforts to conserve a species has to be uh, turned into a management, wildlife or agricultural management plan. Uh, so, in, I mean, in Germany we have a very managed uh, forestry industry as well. So, there's, uh, right, most species here are encultured uh, species. So, is there, when, right, is, is there a point where you need to hand over, so let's, let's assume the, the population is thriving, do you need to hand this over to some wildlife and, and commerce agencies are okay, I'm done or what, so where, where do you see sort of your territory for conservation? I, I think you, you mean my, you know we as the NGO as our group or yeah uh, I, I would love to be in a place where you know that that you're mentioning which is this is how far we'll go and we'll wash our hands off. We've been doing this for 25 years, much before I ever became part of this group. And I don't see the administrative systems really uh, growing at, at the same pace that is necessary. I'm sure someday they'll catch up where, you know, we, we will be able to say that, okay, this is nice. And we, we, we started an insurance program for livestock where every time a carnivore kills uh, an, a, a domestic animal, uh, a compensation is triggered. We started in 2002, this is 2021 in a tiny area and the government is still not able to replicate it. This, this program has won several awards in several places. Multiple government agencies have tried to replicate it. We've ourselves replicated it to 15 our other villages. We are a small team of people. We're just limited by, by the number of people we have uh, and, and that's not happened. So that is the desire uh, and, and that is also tension in conservation which is conservation depends on so much of external funding through NGOs uh, that it is uh, at a point of being a problem in itself. NGO conservation could be a problem of their own. 
and and I think uh, it's it's very true, uh, and I don't know a, a foreseeable solution to that. So you talked. I mean, I really do appreciate the call for extending, not substituting, Mark, but I think extending the notion of biological conservation to cultural issues. And many people have discussed this in terms of thinking about traditional knowledge and you know, some people call it indigenous knowledge and thinking about how that gets associated to how we conceptualize particular species, um, in particular regions. I wonder whether you could speak to whether you think you see risks associated to that expansion also. Because uh, you were noticing, you know, we are, you were talking very much about opening up um, some of the traditional practices associated with the production of Kashmir, for instance, uh, the local ecology, these kinds of things. And I mean, this is the kind of openness that in the agricultural sector, for instance, has led to incredible problems. So the idea that, you know, let's just show the world um, cultural memory, like so show the world uh, more traditional knowledge without any protection associated to it has led to incredible amounts of prospecting and appropriation and you know basically enhancing equity in, in different ways. So do you think there is a risk with this kind of work or is maybe is there something about the specificity of the environment here that makes it impossible to appropriate these practices um, in, a, in a way that I mean, within the market basically? There are, there are many risks. Actually, one of the biggest risks is that, that this itself becomes such a runaway market process that this itself become, comes to the detriment of, and, and in this case, you know, snow leopard, I mean all wildlife, and Kashmir, I mean all, all human development. That, that risk is there uh, where this kind of openness creates, allows for this very aggressive market to enter a society and, and just completely destroy it inside out. However, markets are getting to these societies whether we like them or not. And, and I think uh, bringing them in knowing what they are capable of and harnessing its energy versus just waiting for the inevitable to happen is, is where I find this peculiar situation to be. Having said that, you know, there are, there are other grave concerns like I mentioned, the whole army dimension, uh, we could do everything we want and then, you know, tomorrow if a war breaks out between India and China, this area is going to be done. Right? You know, there, there wouldn't be a sheep or a snow leopard to protect uh, in this space, at least. So, and, and, and that we've seen on the borders with India and Pakistan, where the, the army conflict is so high that there's no wildlife left. Uh, Munib, I mentioned him, he led a camera trapping expedition in one of the, one of the really heavy conflict areas. And, and essentially, they didn't find anything that weighed more than two kilos. Um, so, there are, there are risks, but I think sometimes, it, you know, this is the frustrating part of being a conservationist, the, the wickedness of it. You try to do something and then it keeps falling apart, it keeps falling apart. But then I, I wonder whether that should stop you from trying. Uh, the, the agri, you know, I'm, I'm from a farming family and, and uh, we've, we've seen the worst of what uh, the, the openness, the, the, the development in farming has created. Uh, but I do see that it's also created opportunities both for farmers and, and there, is, there is conservation still on those places. Uh, but yeah, I would like to talk to you more about it. Good. On this happy note. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Thank, Thank you, you for so the much. answers. Thank you for the questions. And have all a nice evening. Thank you so much.